Ken Gordon. Ken, are you ready? I am. Give me uh, one sec. I'll pull up the charts. But I think... Okay. So your 10 minutes starts now. Great. And I appreciate the opportunity to participate today. So we're going to discuss fitness technology and the physiology of training generally. And uh, we might get a little, a little bit philosophical and talk about the in inherent unfairness of life. So let's, let's get started. So looking at the physical fitness technology sector, uh, before COVID, it was growing at about 15 to 20%, about an $828 billion addressable market. Before the explosive growth with COVID, of course, during quarantine, the hyper growth that we saw and uh, everybody moving to fitness technology and away from in-person solutions. And uh, post-COVID, uh, the forecast is for growth rates to um, ease back to its pre-COVID rate of about 15 to 20%. So if you look at why people are purchasing technology to support their exercise, the, the, this very question has been uh, given in a, in a poll environment. And the number one reason by far, 77% of respondents, was to exercise smarter. And if you look at what's really driving that and what's behind that, when people exercise, they, they want to get better and they want to see improvement. The problem is the existing solutions that are out there don't help. And the reason for that is people who are training in the endurance sports, to do it right and to do it effectively, you really have to target very precise zones that, you're, that, that you need to get to. They're defined around the aerobic threshold and the anaerobic threshold. And uh, with this particular audience, I'll get uh, a little bit more into the physiology than I might normally, than I might normally in this discussion. So um, below the aerobic threshold is zone one and zone two, where you, you really get the most benefit from building an aerobic base. Um, when you get to the higher levels of exertion, really, really pushing hard to get closer to the anaerobic threshold, which is really where you're generating blood lactate faster than, than your body can dispose of it. Um, and those are the most effective ways to train is, is in those zones. The problem is, and this is why life is unfair, is that when people go out to run, they're not thinking about the zones. They just say, well, I'm going to go run. I'm going to push until it feels good, until it hurts like it feels like it should. And what people almost always do is they surpass the aerobic threshold and they're training in zone three. It feels just hard enough that they feel like they're doing some good for their training. The problem is the reason that you want to spend a good amount of time training below the aerobic threshold is that isolates your aerobic systems and maximizes your body's ability to extract oxygen from the air and convert it into oxygen. Similarly, near the anaerobic threshold, you're maximizing your body's ability to process waste products and to, uh, and, and to generate output in that regime. When people spend most of their time in zone three, uh, they're, they're really not optimizing either. Their bodies are using a little bit aerobic, a little bit anaerobic, and as a result, they're not really improving either one. And so that's why life is unfair, is that it feels like where people are doing the most good, and as it turns out, it's the most useless place to train. And it's kind of like cooking meat without a thermometer. You, you kind of feel the oven, that feels about right, uh, maybe that'll work for a while. So the solution that we're offering to address this is automated live coaching that's based on science to help people address this, that is going to measure the right metrics, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, that makes it more effective than anything on the planet. But most importantly, it's easier to use than anything available. So there are a lot of products out there that work to help people train. The very best physiological indicator for finding these training zones is blood lactate, and that is the thermometer for the stove. So elite-level athletes in endurance sports have been drawing their blood to measure lactate for decades. Um, professionals in some of the spectator sports are just starting to go down this road the last couple of years. Uh, pictured is the, the football, the, the Liverpool Football Club. Um, in, in America, we call it soccer. Um, and that team is the United Kingdom and the European champions, and they test with lactate. Um, probably not, not a surprise that they're at the forefront. So what we're, we're doing to test, to, to measure blood lactate is we're going to use non-invasive blood lactate uh, the sensors. And essentially, there's a few hundred million dollars worth of R&D that's been done 
uh, over the past years in measuring non-invasive glucose and uh, for, for all of the applications for diabetes and health. Um, measuring, the, the, as it turns out, glucose as an analyte is very similar to lactate, and so we're, we're almost piggybacking on the research that's been done and, uh, and, and, and providing a non-invasive blood lactate sensor. So as I said, there's a lot, of, a, a lot of competitors. It's a crowded space and a lot of devices that people can get. The problem is none of these devices that are out there really identify these training zones. Um, there are elite solutions that you can use if you're working with a live coach who knows how to interpret it. There's easy solutions like Fitbit that, that get, gives you some very easy, straightforward information, but it's not helping you hit zones. And what happens with all of these users who are buying technology to improve is they start using it, they train for a couple of months, they end up targeting zone three, they hit a plateau, they get frustrated, and they quit. And so there's, there's no real solution out there that really solves this problem. And, and that's why we haven't seen the market converge on a solution yet. All of these billion-dollar companies, but nobody really has more than 10 15% market share just because none of the devices work, because none of them target the zones the right way. Looking at our device that we've, that we've built to do this, uh, really in two parts. On, on the right, you can see our hardware sensor prototype and testing. We do have a working prototype. But on the left, I'm going to spend a little time talking about the, the software interface and the platform. So talking about the actual product, the elite-level athletes get it. From their point of view, they're already drawing blood to measure lactate. It's that worth it. From their point of view, this is a way to do it in real time without needles. And they're literally calling us on the phone, hey, is your product ready yet? Um, but we're thinking about the broader recreational market. We're a startup company, and so we have to have broader appeal. And so we've spent a lot of time thinking about what makes this information useful to the broader general public. They don't care about blood lactate. They don't care about volume periodization. They don't care about polarized training and all the things that make our training mechanisms so effective. All they care about is, hey, coach, Tell me uh, how long you want me to go and whether I should speed up or slow down. And so we've built that into an interface that is actually available in the App Store. And we've been testing uh, not only our user interaction, see what works from a user experience and a user interface perspective, UX, UI, but also getting a sense of how we're doing in digital marketing and seeing how our customer acquisition costs are comparing to our customer lifetime value. Looking at what the market is looking at, um, there, there's a number of quotes from people in different spots in the market. The one I'll highlight is uh, from the, the gentleman in the middle who's on the board of the Montgomery County Roadrunners Club uh, in the D.C. area, which is where we're located. And uh, he, he basically told us when, when in, in enthusiasm for what we're doing, you know, we want this so badly, you can put any quote you want in your pitch deck and attribute it to me. We just just go get, go get the thing built. We want it. So that's really been the market reaction. So in, in, in this presentation, uh, we've been asked to talk a little bit about our market impact, and uh, we are pre-product, and so uh, we're still really in our go-to-market phase. But that said, we've even at this point had uh, an impact on our users, um, not only from our beta testers. A number of our beta testers have, uh, in some cases, more than doubled their measure performance. But as you can see uh, on screen and myself pictured, it's having an impact. So I mentioned that uh, we're doing some tests for how our product is actually engaging the market. Um, we're seeing 19% retention beyond 30 days. That compares to 6% for top fitness apps that have exited for $200 million, 4% for all mobile apps. Talking about our team, I have a, a business experience running a P&L. Paul Guthrie, the co-founder, is really the visionary behind what became this company. And uh, he's an elite-level rower, represented the U.S. at the Pan American Games, and also an accomplished entrepreneur with several exits. And it's really his vision that has led us to be where we are now. Randy Deering, our CTO with experience in software and hardware. Pam Sutherland, former six-time All-American swimmer, world-class coach, and we're marketing for our chief marketing officer. Also, our advisory board level, I'll call out uh, John Kelly, a world-class runner, has done things that only uh, less than two dozen people have done. Lindsay Topin, of just a world-class investor as a venture capitalist and has really helped us think about our product and our company. So this is where we are. 
Um, our one, one of our board members mentioned to me that uh, that, I, that this is where I need to bring up that we're fundraising. Uh, we're doing uh, a million dollar pre-seed. We've raised 500 so far in this round, and we've raised uh, 1.4 million to date. Um, if you're interested in more, you can contact me at my uh, email. I'll show for you in a second. But to summarize, the fitness tech is large. It's growing. As a team, we've used lactate-based training successfully for over 15 years, and uh, we're making the world's best training accessible to democratize fitness for everybody and make it easy to, to train and reach everybody's individual potential. Thanks very much for this opportunity to present. I look forward to answering questions. Thank you, Ken. Uh, the judges can ask questions now, if you have any. Yeah, I'm just trying to verify. So for, for your product, you need your bike as well as your like watch, or is it an app that is installed on existing watch? That's a fantastic question and one that I didn't want to try to get into for this conversation because it's a longer conversation. So the bike is the, the, the bike is but but I'll tell it quickly. The the bike was um, for beta for, for testing our prototype. So the sensor in our prototype form is in a neoprene sleeve that you put on your leg. The sensor that we're productizing, and that's essentially what we're doing with this million dollar raise, is going to be in the form of a sensor that is going to be on an Apple Watch wristband. And then we'll just send you the wristband, you put it on your Apple Watch, and then your Apple Watch will tell you whether to speed up or slow down. Great question. Okay, so basically you are targeting users who, like, uh, you are tar targeting iWatch users who will add additional functionality, correct? Again, a great question. Our 2022 go-to-market strategy is to start penetration with the iOS users because it's a, a hardware platform that people already have. Once we start to build market traction, our 2023 strategy is a standalone device for people who are not in the iOS environment. It, it seems to me that um, your highest margin would probably be uh, in the, the elite fitness area because if you create something that is incredibly useful and improves their performance, people will buy it for a large amount of money. They have very deep pockets. Have you considered product segmenting such that you could harvest that large margin as you try to create uh, functionality that will be democratized? It's a great question. We have given a lot of thought to it. Right now where we're coming down is we feel like there's a lot of value in, in, in the, the trickle-down effect of providing the same version of the, the device to the elites who can tell their office coworkers, hey, get this device, it's excellent. And they don't have to feel like they're in a second class of of user for not having the quote unquote elite version. Um, that's where we come down right now, but we remain open-minded longer term as we get long, closer to launch, we're gonna look at price elasticity for the two segments and see, see what ends up working out better. Any other questions from the judges? If not, uh, let's uh, get ready for the next one.